All right, welcome to the Saturday afternoon sessions here in room 212 in lovely Pasadena, California. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce all the speakers today and especially this one. So our speaker today is a potter, a pilot, a professor, and the author of Red Planet Leadership. Please join me in welcoming James Melton. No, first one. First, first one. That's all. <laughs> Eric from Norway has the book. It came probably came the longest way. I don't. Anyone come from beyond Norway? Turkey. Turkey. Yeah. Oh well, welcome, welcome. <laughs> How many books did you bring, Jim? <laughs> I, I brought a few. <laughs> I brought a few. <laughs> anyway, I should. Get another one out. I might refer to it later on. All right, so who will go to Mars? Um, how can we build a functional society that works together harmoniously out there when we don't have our own house in order here? Have you heard that before in this conference? Why should we even send humans to Mars? I mean, what's the purpose in that? And what makes us so optimistically positive? double redundancy there, Op optimistically positive that we can and will do this. Well, uh, actually, uh, I wrote an article uh, about who will go to Mars. Are you familiar with the Adastra magazine? All right, well, the next issue will handle my article, and it's called Who Will Go to Mars? I had the opportunity uh, up in Mojave at the FAR rocket launch on May 5th, same day as uh, InSight, uh, for the UCLA team to send their rocket up. Dr. Zubin was there, and I had the pleasure of doing a two-hour interview, interview with him, and uh, they selected that to put in the next issue. So pick it up. It's a great magazine. So all, in order for all of this to happen, we have to do something significant. We have to realize that a few things have to happen. Number one, we have to make a shift. The shift I'm talking about is from wanting to having, from thinking about to doing, from dreaming to experiencing. And we as individuals don't really have to go that much further to make this happen. It's, it's a significant shift, but it's easy to make. Uh, a lot of people say they want change, but they're not willing to make the changes necessary to bring about the change. I say that's what Webster in his best-selling book, The Dictionary, calls stupid. See, you can't even have change without being willing to make that change. How many of you were in the um, program that I did on, on Thursday? All right. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are here now? <laughs> Well, not even half the room is here now. That's good. Hi, hi Robert. Good to see you. Anyway, um, I talked about the Zubrionic shift and how Isaac Asimov actually put it into his chrono chronological order of the, uh, the uh, scientific developments. The Zubrionic shift has to do with, uh, in reference to Dr. Robert Zubrin, in honor of him and what he's doing to bring technology and culture together and bringing these different uh, uh, disciplines into balance. As diverse as we think we are, and I, you'll see why I'm saying that, we have a lot of commonalities. We really do. Uh, any psychologist will tell you that one out of every three people on the planet need some kind of uh, psychological help in their financial situation, their business, their relationships. Now, I want you to take a look at the person sitting on your left. Just look at them. Okay, now look at the person sitting on your right. <clears throat> okay, now if, if they look okay, <laughs> it's you I'm talking to. We all say, well, I don't have any problem, but he does, you know, Bill Lewis. No, Bill Lewis doesn't have any problems, I'm sure. So, so uh, everyone, because we're getting going here, just for a moment, stand up. Everyone stand up for just a moment. Now, put your things down on the chair. Put your hand high over your head. 
right now. Kind of twist around, twist around exercise like you did last summer. <laughs> twist around like that. Okay. Now on the count of arms down. On the count of three, I would like you to immediately turn around and shake hands with the person behind you. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. All right. Sit down. You can sit down. Go ahead and sit down. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So, now, okay. Now, now, how many were you like this? You know. Okay. Question. Do you think I could pull that on you again? Probably not. Oliver Wendell Holmes said the mind, stretched to a new idea, can never return to its original dimension. What you are absorbing, I won't say learning because I believe you all are far beyond me and the Mars issue, but what we are absorbing here this weekend is phenomenal, and it can never be taken from us. So I liked what Oliver Wendell Holmes said. It's, it's, it's extremely important. Abraham Maslow, his name has been brought up a number of times in the sessions that I've been in over the last couple of days. He's a former humanistic psychologist, built a pyramid of a self-actualized person, and he identified the four levels of awareness. And this has to do with who's going to go to Mars. Uh, the four levels of awareness, he called them the unconscious incompetence, the conscious incompetence, the conscious competence, and the unconscious competence. Let me, let me go to it a little easier. I like the six levels of awareness that I came up with. It's called toilet training. How many have kids? All right. You know what I'm talking about when I say toilet training. There are six levels in toilet training. Number one is the kid wets his pants. He doesn't care. The mother cares, so she changes the pants. Number two, he wets his pants a little cold and clammy, doesn't like the feel of it, and he cries, so the mother hears him cry, doesn't want him crying, so she changes his pants. Number three, he wets his pants and he's looking around and he says, where is this coming from? He doesn't know. Right on his heels is number four, he wets his pants and he says, I'm doing that? Number five, he's aware before he has to go. And number six, if I do this, this, and this, I'll have to do this. Now, a lot of people, I'm sorry to say this, but a lot of people in our society are only at level three in wetting their pants. They don't know that what they think about comes about. They don't know that what they talk about and those people with whom they associate are creating the future in their lives, especially what they're thinking about. Well, yeah, wash, you call, DC you're talking about? Yeah, okay, there you go. Uh, I thought maybe we were going back to George, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Well, let's go back further. Plato, 2,500 years ago, said the ignorant don't know they're ignorant. And I think there are an awful lot of people walking around the planet that they don't know, they don't know, they don't know. They have no concept at all. So why Mars? Because we can. We have to give ourselves permission to do so. This is a perfect sandbox at a perfect time with everything coming together so well I've got goosebumps on. <laughs> I think it's important. All right, now how do we do it? Well, Robert Zubrin says, we take the best of what we have and leave the worst behind. Sounds a little simple, but let me, let me if you haven't um, seen Zubrin lately, <laughs> great, great man. Th this man is a visionary. He's a prolific writer and author of The Case for Mars, which is the guide that a lot of people today are following to go to Mars. Let me give you a little, pardon me? Yeah, or anywhere else. Or anywhere else. Right, Kelly, anywhere else. All right. Let me give you another photograph of uh, Zubrin when he's a little more comfortable. Uh, with his arm around wife. my wife, Dana. <laughs> yes, my wife, Dana. She's the woman who makes my life the spectacular adventure that it is. And by the way, she said, Bill, give him my best because <laughs> she's back, uh, you know, she's doing her board the look work. On his face, yeah. Though, he's yeah. Really yeah, he's a, he's a good man, and yeah, that's, that's good. All right, so he said, 
it's time for humanity to journey to Mars. He said, though Mars is distant, we are far better prepared today to send humans to Mars than we were to travel to the moon at the commencement of the space age. When was that, by the way? What year? 61 was when they started. Okay, okay. Right, 1957. What happened in 57? Sputnik. You better believe it. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what. Oh, we wanted space superiority, all right. We, want, we wanted to go to the moon, but what really got us off the launch pad was when Russia launched that little 23-inch sphere around the Earth. It scared us to death, scared the screaming bejeebers out of us. And we wanted to do that, but we realized we were sadly lagging behind. Thank goodness for that good old U.S. of A. ingenuity. When it came to the moon, the leadership got it. And to set the stage, it was John F. Kennedy. Uh, he gave a lecture on May 25th, 1961 to Congress. And he made in that, state, in that uh, lecture a civilization-changing statement that I believe a lot of people did not even recognize. So let me just share that with you. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Ladies and gentlemen, those were not words. That was a vision. And when you capture a vision for your personal life, your business, your community, your nation, people will rally behind you to the ends of the earth and beyond to help you reach your dream. It's been proven. But if you don't have a dream, people will continually meander on through your path, preventing you from reaching any end whatsoever. Explain this to me. Why 50 years ago did, were we able to put people on the moon and still today in our society we have so many disconnects and barriers? Sometimes I wonder about that. So let me, let me go a little bit back further here. I talked about Plato before. We, we dreamt about Mars a long time ago. May 20th, 1937, the best picture of Mars we had at the time. How many went out to see Mars the other night? Oh, by the way, I forgot to turn my timer on. So you, you okay, well, <laughs> give me a little leeway. <laughs> Plato, astronomy compels the soul to look upward and leads us from this world to another. 2,500 years ago, he said that. We took another picture of Mars. Uh, 1976, the Viking, uh, the, uh, Viking no, Mariner was there. And 19, uh, 2003, uh, they put some more uh, mosaics together and came up with that deal. I, I do this little thing to bring us back to reality. Mars is half the diameter of Earth. These are all approximate. One year on Mars is 687 Earth days. One day soul on Mars is 24 hours and 39 minutes, give or take a few seconds, one way or the other. One-third gravity of Earth, the average temperature is about 81 below. It can go down to 240 below. It can go down about, up to about 70 above. Uh, the average uh, temperature is about 81. There is water on Mars, as we know for sure. Uh, it has two small moons, Deimos and Phobos, and Mars it has, the, has the tallest mountain in the solar system, so we think it's called Olympus Mons, and it's about three times the size of Mount Everest and about the size of Texas. So, uh, so who's going to go there? And what, what are the determining factors that will qualify someone to go? Well, I know what the factors will not be. 
We will not select people to go to Mars by skin color, by nationality, by gender, by religion, and by political viewpoints. So who, in fact, will go? We're going to need contractors, engineers, scientists, chefs, sous chefs. We're going to need comedians, cobblers. We're going to need uh, writers. We're going to need potters. We're going to need speakers. We're going to need politicians, lawyers, psychiatrists. Well, you know, maybe not psychiatrists. <laughs> I mean, everyone that goes to Mars is going to be crazy anyway. So you know, we don't have to worry about that one. OK, so who will go? Well, take a look here. I think uh, those people who are ready, willing, and able, I think uh, people who are enthusiastic and eager, people who are risk takers, trustworthy, solution seekers, ethical, respectful, compassionate, curious, can do, uh, look for common sense resolutions and clear thinking in an emergency. Do you know people like that? Actually, we have a whole room full of them here. But I'm talking to the choir. And you know that as well as I do. You know this gal, Anastasia Stepanova? Neat gal. She's not here. She sent her best. We are in, yes, we do have Russian contacts. I, I do, do connect with Russia. And uh, she and I connect on, on internet quite a bit. And she's in Europe right now. And she sent her, uh, her greetings. And uh, I think she will be either the first woman or one of the first women. Uh, women on Mars. <clears throat> All right. Um, I also know that one defining distinction everyone that goes to Mars will have in common is the quest for the betterment of humanity. It comes right down to that. My friend Alain, he is uh, from France. He lives in Palm Desert, not far from me in Palm Springs. And uh, he's in Montreal right now uh, visiting with his wife uh, for, for the summer. It's a little hot in Palm Springs now, and they don't like the heat. I'm a lizard, so it doesn't matter. But uh, anyway, he, he does his work in epigenetics, uh, studying the DNA chain. And he said, Jim, you know, uh, in reality, there is no such thing as a difference in race within our human species. We are all homo sapiens. And this is one of the things I wanted to get across here. This is probably one of the main things, and I'm writing a new book on this. Uh, he said, in, of all of the 8 billion people, or close to 8 billion people on the planet, all of them, there is less than one-tenth of one percent difference in our DNA. And the minuscule percentage, the larger portion of that minuscule one-tenth of one percent, has to do with immunity and diseases. So basically, we are all one race. We, we need to realize that. And uh, if you want to break it up a little bit, take it down, something is one percent different than us, still 99% the same, that's orangutans and chimpanzees. You want to take a 2% different than us, still 98% the same, that's gorillas. So you, you, you figure that one out. So being only one race as we are, why do we have so many barriers between us in our perceived races, I say perceived races, cultures, ethnicities, religions, and politics? Einstein put it this way. He said, I have no special talent. I'm only passionately curious. I love that. E equals mc squared. Well, I've come up with this one. I equals dc squared. Imagination equals diversity times curiosity squared. <clears throat> and diversity, I'm going to put this up as well. I think this is important. Diversity, rep the diversity represented within our species, combined with curiosity, is the pillar of innovation. Those who embody these traits, tra traits will be those who will colonize the new world. I could probably go on about that, but I would like to... Uh, I'm not going to talk about spin-off technology right now, although it's a great subject. 
I did a program with Catherine Thornton, one of the astronauts in San Francisco, about that. It's a fascinating topic. I shouldn't put that up there either. That's another day. Okay, let's talk about Carl Sagan. <laughs> um, he passed away in 1996. How many know who Carl Sagan is? All right. Any read, read his books? Yeah. Did anyone ever meet Carl? Okay. I had the privilege of meeting him. I sat on a plane one day, and he sat next to me. He was flying back home to Ithaca. And uh, fascinating man. I had a wonderful opportunity to chat with that man. And he uh, created a, a, a piece for the Phoenix Lander. Now, I'll end with this, because I want Carl to make the final statement of this program. He created a, 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 a audio for the Phoenix Lander, which is on the Phoenix Lander waiting for the first astronauts on Mars, or cosmonauts, or all, whomever they will be. He passed away in 96, and he made the, this statement just a, a few days, or a few weeks, or months, I'm not sure exactly, before he passed away. And, I, and I'd like you to hear it. It's only about two minutes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carl Sagan. This is a place where I often work in Ithaca, New York, near Cornell University. Maybe you can hear in the background a 200-foot uh, waterfall, which uh, is probably, I would guess, a rarity on Mars. I don't know why you're on Mars. Maybe you're there because we've recognized we have to carefully move small asteroids around to avert the possibility of one impacting the Earth with catastrophic consequences. And while we're up in near Earth space, it's only a hop, skip, and a jump to Mars. Maybe we're on Mars because we recognize that if there are human communities and many worlds, the chances of us being rendered extinct by some catastrophe on one world is, uh, is much less. Or maybe we're on Mars because we have to be, because there is a deep nomadic impulse built into us by the evolutionary process. We come, after all, from hunter-gatherers and from 99.9% .9 of our tenure on Earth. We've been wanderers, and uh, the next place to wander to is Mars. But whatever the reason you're on Mars is, I'm glad you're there, and I wish I was with you. Determined, are you saying, or what would we like to see in there? Um, I, I guess, um, so how can we go from discussing the qualities that we'd like to see in a room like this uh, to um, getting that to the people who will actually end up making those decisions and saying this person wants to go to Mars? 
if, if I'm hearing what you're asking is how can I go to Mars? And how can I be selected? Is that what I'm hearing? There's probably a little bit of that in there. Okay, all right. Answer the question you want to answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, after hearing Carl, I don't know about you, but I get all choked up. I really do, because I'm passionate about this stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's in my heart. And uh, well, that's one thing. I, I think uh, being passionate is important. And I, I think holding the idea in your mind that you can make a difference, it is possible to open doors. People do listen. I mean, a couple of thousand years ago, one guy changed the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're talking about what we can do. We are human beings. We can do anything we desire. And I think there's a commonality in all of us that has a tendency to steer toward the positive, I, I, I believe. That's all I'm going to say right now on that, please. What's wrong with letting people self-select? Self-select, that would be excellent. Uh, but I think there has to be more of a, a guideline with... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm... I'm I, no, I, I won't be the one to make those decisions. I really won't be, but I think if we have the ethical the base to work from as an individual and our intentions are, are good, there is no reason why self-selection wouldn't work. <coughs> so I, I, as I said in my other program, every son, every t every, we need to follow our feelings. Every once in a while you see someone and you know right away, instantly, that you hate them <laughs> or that you love them. So follow your feelings. Feelings won't lie to you. Yes. Um, do you, you envision social engineering being part of the, uh, the strategy to be able to be efficient in starting to start a colony in Mars? When you say social engineering, are you meaning programs that will guide us in a way that would yes. structure? Well, we have those now in, corp in the corporate world. What are the corporate policies? How do we function in a corporation? How do we create cohesive teams? What do we do? You know? So we do that now. Yeah, I think it's very important to have, because whenever you enter into a team, you may have an idea, but if you open it up for a general consensus, you'll find a thousand ideas. And they'll all be different. In my programs, when I do ethics programs, I mean, there are people who uh, have created a little scenario. I, I put out scenarios for people. And I think, well, they're all going to come back with the same answer. No way. They come back with different answers. And they're all, they all have, have validity to agree, some, some degree. Yes? Well, thank you for um, talking about uh, you know, setting your mind on what you want off track. And I've been setting that for, for quite some time. And it's very valuable. You, know, you can also say the other question people are asking, do not use the Antarctica selection process, psychological selection process, as a pattern. They uh, might be able to use this MM5 profile thing, but what they did is they said, okay, back in the 50s when they started this, said, okay, well, these are the categories we think we want to take. They had to take the test and they match it up, and if you don't match, you can't go. And uh, tech people, people have to get through the threshold. What we need to do is have uh, the mock-up, have people take the test, figure out who does well in, yes. in the situation. Yes. Well, that, and use that to create. OK, and that's good. And that's probably another reason for that test, uh, because we learn from it from failure. So that's good. Can we just hold on one second here. Is Rada Sharma here? Rada Sharma is the next speaker, but if, if, uh, if Sharma's not here, then you can carry on. You're not about a Sharma, right? No. Take a couple. Good, so take take, take a couple more questions for those of you who have. Yes, please. Um, at what point do you see traditionally uh, selected careers that become astronauts, such as pilots, scientists, geologists, doctors, move more toward more civilian jobs? I think we'll go to Mars in waves. Uh, this is what I wrote about in the article. Actually, it's the, the interview with Zubrin. 
Zubrin's concept is we will go in waves, probably three waves. The first wave will more than likely be scientists, explorers, uh, people who are um, a very scientifically uh, geologists, etc., like that. The second wave will more than likely be doctors, nurses, uh, paramedics. Uh, they'll include that sort of thing. The third wave will bring more of the general needs of people along with them. Uh, has the speaker arrived yet? I, I think it some, somewhat depends on uh, if, if you have a NASA mission to Mars and you're landing a few people, is one selection criteria. So if BFR is landing on Mars or 100 people at a time, you're going to have a whole different situation. You will. You will. And, but I think that, uh, I think that uh, Musk and Bezos and those who are planning to go to Mars before NASA uh, will have the ethical base to respect the uh, space treaty and protect the planet in a manner in which it should be protected. I, I believe fully that that's going to happen. With those people, I, I, I can't say about other countries. I don't know about other countries. That's why I think it's probably necessary for us to go first and fast. Uh, because I know, what, I know what America is in the core. But I know, I know that the people who are involved in this, like, like you folks, you are, you are people who are staunchly into this and want to, to do it right. And at the risk of doing something wrong, we'd rather err on the side of caution. Other thoughts, comments, insights, criticisms, <laughs> ideas? There's yes. a danger of testing people. To be criteria, and if you go to the left field people who actually have unique contributions, you get the same as you tested before. When you test people, um, years ago I was tested to see if I had the ability to be an IT yeah. chief scientist. Sure. Not at all. Because I didn't the criteria because my personality wasn't there for Sure. This is why That's diversity is so critical. I mean, we've got to bring everyone in. As I said, um, diversity combined with creativity, is the pillar of innovation. And we need innovative people, yes. So I, I concur with what you said. But to answer the question, the first question is, there will be people in charge, and they will trust us to self-select. And that's been the history <laughs> of, especially Antarctica, but also um, the Astro I mean, I could bring up the military. Are you, are you selecting the military? There are certain criteria. I mean, how healthy are you? Age will make it. Age will be a factor. I probably won't be going to Mars. You know, but uh, but I can see people in this room who will be actually going to Mars. Uh, the average person that goes is probably going to be between 20 and 40 years of age. Uh, uh, Zubrin says 25 years of age who has completed their education and has the ability to uh, to and the knowledge and the interest to do this, to make a contribution on it. And you might, like Musk says, you've got to be willing to die. <laughs> but we're all going to die anyway. So how are we doing, Bill? Anybody here yet? No, no one yet. So you still have the floor. You're, you've, got, you've got the best crowd. The best so, crowd. Uh, yeah, I just yeah. sit here. Yeah. 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 No, no, no. <laughs> question? No, no question. Okay. In a way, that's short self select because they're fine. Then there's a further selection process. Yes. But Layers. The space agency and NASA do a, a, yeah. a thing that would, would certainly block both me out, which is <laughs> one of the tricks they do is ring up at 4 o'clock in the morning and act like they didn't realize it was 4 o'clock in the morning, maybe midday because they're ringing really for dollars. Yes. And it's to see how enthusiastic you really are to go to Mars because you don't lose your ragged if you wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, you probably do want to go. Sure. Well, the point is, we, we, we can go. <laughs> We can go now. We have the will to go. We do have the technology to go. And we need to be going. Yes. There you go. So I, I've been reading a trilogy, and I'm going to slaughter his name, Chixin Lu, the, the Chinese science fiction writer. And one of the things that really strikes me about the series, it's good in many ways, is it's written by Chinese. It's written in Chinese and translated. It's very Chinese-centric. 
And so when the earth is threatened in this trilogy, it's all about how the Chinese rise to the occasion. The rest of the world plays a very peripheral part. I think we have the same danger that we, we sit here, I'm going to assume primarily Americans, and we're very American-centric. You know, if we're going to go to Mars, hey, it's Americans. If we're going to solve a scientific <clears throat> problem, it's Americans. And yeah. maybe, all right, find some Europeans. But, you know, I think we've got to be careful here. The first people on Mars could be Chinese. Yeah, well. And, and that may not be bad. I wouldn't mind having a, a uh, collection of uh, nationalities. I think that would be good. Um, I, I wouldn't mind having uh, male and female. I think that would be marvelous. I, I don't mind speaking to an all-male audience, but I tell you, uh, when you have women in the, the audience, uh, I, I find it uh, very much of a, uh, a different reaction uh, the first person to ask a question in this program was Hannah. Uh, they, they are curious. And I'm not saying we aren't, guys. <laughs> we are curious. But women adds, add a flavor to our environment. That's why, I guess, why we have men and win, women. <laughs> I'll get off that subject right now. Did you have a, a Eric, yeah, a I, thought? I just had a follow up to what you're saying. You're right. And you can listen to the way I talk. I'm obviously not from there. You're Chinese! <laughs> <laughs> Scandinavia, in which yeah. most people look like you and me, but where we have a quite different system of society. For instance, public, free healthcare, free universities, and where society is organized in a different way. A much more egalitarian society. So for okay, instance, all right. It's a long time ago since we had our first female prime minister, and actually, we, at the moment, our prime minister is a woman, and nobody thinks twice about it. I know it was much more difficult to think about it here. So, yeah. Um, even so, so the, even among democracies and even among rich Western countries, there are many there are many different models. Okay, of so you're. I, so yeah, so um, what I'm saying is that um, <laughs> I, I agree with a lot of what you say, but to me, as a Scandinavian, and I'm also a lecturer in Norway, so I've I've go to a lot of conferences, and to me, you sound very American. So mm -hmm. if you had lectured in Norway, and you should do, by the way, <laughs> invite me. I'll go. I'll, I'll tip, tip off some people. I'll because keep the phone line is, open. Because what you're saying is very interesting. But if you had spoken at a conference in Norway, people would have said, that was interesting, but he's so American. The talk about passion, the talk about sort of self-improvement. Yeah. In, in Scandinavia, improvement is, yeah, you do believe in self-improvement, but improvement is also seen as a sort of collective thing. I find yeah, that yeah. Uh, I, I find I speak in Paris and uh, France often, the same thing there. Uh, yeah, the same and thing there. I I find that uh, that uh, comment. Yeah, and it's not. I mean, that's not meant in a negative way. No, it's I understand. Just, it's just sort of to underline that there are some cultural differences. There are not necessarily as I'm. I'm by the way, I'm going to read that <clears> because <throat> everybody says that that Chinese yeah. is very interesting. But there are some differences yeah. this is, between people who seem to be from the same culture. Right. This is, this is why I'm working on the next book, which has to do with culture. Yeah. And uh, how can we bring our cultures together without, without diminishing who we are? Because we all have wonderful... Frank? I think there may be a difference between the kind of people who want to explore Mars and come back home, and those who want to go permanently. Okay, a difference between those who want to explore Mars and those who want to come back from Mars. Yeah. No, those who want to stay on Mars. Those who want to stay, stay on Mars, okay. Oh, yeah, there probably will be a difference, sure. Yeah, and that's okay. That we're talking diversity, and that the diversity is a good thing. That's what America is, by the way. If anybody didn't know that, that's what we are. We are a, a, a country of immigrants, and that's how we, that's how we began. Everybody over here is an immigrant. <laughs> uh, and, and I think when we go to Mars, we'll have the same thing. Did you have a question, sir? All right. We are talking today, but in two generations on Mars, we will be strangers. Mm -hmm. And will we be welcome? 
Uh, I think we'll probably, forgive me for the American statement, but I think we'll, pr probably, we'll probably be as welcome as we believe we are. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, any other thoughts? You were, you were all British 250 years ago, and that changed very easily. It, it yeah. changed, it changed, and it changed beautifully. And, and, and some of it was not good. And, and I'm, I'm a reader of um, uh, David McCullough. I don't know if you like David McCullough's work or not, but he's write, written some beautiful things. And the, the question came up on the Charlie Rose show one time, why don't we rewrite the Constitution? And he point blank said, we don't have anybody capable of writing it. <laughs> now, that's his statement, not mine. I'm sure there are people That, well, that's true. That, that's a whole different story, Kelly. We, we need to get a whole different mindset in there on, on our government and how we do that. Um, and I have my viewpoints on that as well. So, uh, hey, I thank you so much. I know you have other places to go and other programs. They're all great. You've been a delight.